In the late 40s, stock car racing wasn't the high dollar spectacle it is today by a long shot. In fact, most of these Sunday afternoon good old boy lawn parties were one-fourth auto race and three-fourths bare knuckles brawl. But in 1949, when a farmer and businessman named Harold Brasington carved a racetrack out of a peanut field in Darlington, South Carolina, the sport of stock car racing took a huge step towards the big time at just the right moment to welcome in the new wave of high-winding Detroit V8s. Now, with asphalt paving and bank turns, drivers could really open it up all the way around the track. And the old 88 had the horsepower to do it. Before the Rocket 88 hit town, the bad boy race car was the Hudson Hornet. Two tons of full-frame road warrior with a 300 cubic inch flathead six for power, this tank had ruled the strictly stock classes for two years on sheer torque and enough body mass to nerf everyone else out of its way. The Oldsmobile, with lighter weight and the ability to turn far more RPMs, was about to change the game. During the next few years, Oldsmobile's cleaned house, winning five out of the eight NASCAR Grand National races in 1949, 10 out of the 19 races in 1950, and 20 out of the 41 races in 1951. Stock car racing was growing into a huge sporting series, and fans were parading from the racetrack straight to the car dealerships. Thanks to a new manufacturing technique called platform engineering, by this time, the old 88, along with its B-body sisters from General Motors, Chevy, Buick, and Pontiac, shared quite a few styling characteristics. But Olds was still the horsepower leader, and for 1952, the Super 88, 303 cubic inch engine, sported the new Quadrajet four barrel carburetor, and cranked out 160 horsepower and 284 foot-pounds of torque. These cars, you could, you could hold the brake on and rev them up as high as they would go, and they would peel the tires till you get out of sight. I mean, that's, I, I don't do that anymore, but I, I have did that with them, so it never tear up anything. That's what always impressed me. But the cars were starting to get fat and starting to become victims of Harley Earl's love of chrome. At this rate, the rockets were well on their way to becoming parade floats instead of race winners. By the middle of the 50s, a huge shift was taking place in America, and you could see it here better than anywhere else. During the past few years, American cars had made the transition from round, stodgy looking and boring into long, low, sleek, and exciting. By 1957, Olds had everyone in their rearview mirror. Here was a car that took design, performance, and luxury to the limit. The 57 Olds Golden Rocket 88 was made to commemorate GM's 50th anniversary, and it was one sweet ride. For this model, Olds cut way back on the chrome trim, but poured a lot of touch and feel into the passenger compartment to create a very special personal luxury car. But even though it had grown again in size, weight, and luxury, the Olds engine builders made sure it was still a rocket. The 57 Oldsmobiles proved that the Olds designer's crystal ball still showed the way to the future. Some big things were ahead for Oldsmobile. Stay with us for the rock and roll years when the American muscle car continues. In 1957, this was a living large. The 57 Chevys and Fords were setting new sales records in what Detroit called the low price field. But this year, Old sold over 390,000 of these dream boats to people who wanted something a little nicer. My first car when I turned 18 uh, was a 57 Oldsmobile. It was a two-door hardtop, and it was pink and white, if you can believe that. Engine power had grown from 185 horsepower in 1954 to 240 in 1956 to 277 in 1957. The 57 Rocket was a board and stroke version of that original 303 motor. It now measured 371 cubic inches. With a Rochester four barrel carb and 9.5 to one compression, it laid down 277 horsepower. But the big news for hot car enthusiasts was the J2 option, which featured three two-barrel Rochester carburetors and cranked out 312 horsepower. The J2 engine was only available to racers and a select few others who knew the secret password at the old parts counter. 
But with all the car's extra weight and size, they was finally starting to feel some competition from Ford and Chevrolet on the stock car tracks. Ford's blown 312 and Chevy's fuel-injected 283 were really putting the heat on everyone. And even with the J2's 312 horses, those rockets were a big load to carry. Out on the street and at the drag strip, the same principle that had created the Rocket 88 legend now worked against Oldsmobile, as the power-to-weight ratio was clearly in favor of smaller, lighter cars. When General Motors joined the Automobile Manufacturers Association ban on racing in 1957, a couple of its GM stablemates, Chevy and Pontiac, continued with backdoor support for their race teams. Olds, on the other hand, saw this as an opportunity to once and for all turn their backs on all that low-class racing stuff and take their rightful place as one of the world's premier luxury automakers. This is the look of Olds mobility. By the end of the decade, Oldsmobiles looked more at home in the homecoming parade rather than the parade lap of an NASCAR race. When they quit racing, though, somebody must have forgotten to tell the Olds engine lap because those mad scientists who created the rocket motors continued to make horsepower by the ton. Old's new 315 horsepower, 394 cubic inch engine helped NASCAR champion Lee Petty drive an Oldsmobile to victory in the 1959 Daytona 500. His 59 Olds used parts picked up at fire sale prices from Olds racers who had left the building when Oldsmobile pulled the plug. Petty's photo finish victory would be the last for Oldsmobile on the high bank tracks for nearly 20 years. The official decision gave Lee Petty in number 42 the victory by a margin of less than one yard over Johnny Beauchamp's number 73. The cars Oldsmobile created during the early 60s continued their trend of making luxurious cars for people who like to drive. Cars like the Starfire were textbook rocket Oldsmobiles. Striking good looks, a lot of power under the hood, and plenty of comfort. But when American car buyers called for smaller, more economical models, Olds was ready, not with an El Cheapo small car, but a truly innovative model called the F-85 Jetfire. This downsized rocket featured a truly unique power plant, an all-aluminum 215 cubic inch V8 with a turbocharger. It was more evidence that the people who made Oldsmobiles believed that luxury and high style could coexist with horsepower, torque, and sporty looks. The F-85 Cutlass model became the platform for another Oldsmobile legend, the 1964 442. Four, 400 cubic inch V8 engine, 345 horsepower. Four, four barrel carburation. Two, dual exhausts. Fifteen years after the original Rocket 88 pioneered the concept of putting your highest horsepower engine in a mid-sized, lightweight body, the 442 became Oldsmobile's player in what would become the muscle car era. For many in Detroit, building muscle cars was a totally new exercise. But thanks to those Rocket 88s for Oldsmobile, it was just another case of been there, done that. That's our story. Thanks for watching, and please remember, don't crush them, restore them.